Recently, I caught up with the CEO of Spar International, Tobias Wasmut, and his head of brand, Gary Harris. With me in the chair was Joe Boner of Boner Design Lab. What we did in this special episode was really look at the role flagship stores play in the spa business, in this case, across 14 markets, really driving and share innovation across the world. And it proved a fascinating episode. So I just want to quickly frame it for those that don't know Sparks. We are in worldwide, we're in 48 countries. Our roots are European, Western European, back in 32. About two thirds of our global sales, which in 2019 were just over 37 billion euro. Two thirds of the sales coming out of Western Europe. That's um, very strong in the proximity area. We'll talk about quite a number of markets from Western Europe today. <coughs> our growth leader has been Central and Eastern Europe. We've got Compound annual growth of 10% in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, Russia is very important, Hungary, uh, Croatia, Slovenia, the countries which we term as part of the ASPIAG uh, organization. I'll come back to that later. It's about Austria's international developments. So a key growth region, growth leader over the last five years. And it may surprise maybe more of our European um, peers and colleagues from the industry. SPA is a leading retailer in sub-Saharan Africa and in and the Middle East. We have a presence in 15 countries in Africa and the Middle East. And we'll be visiting today in our tour here, South Africa, and looking at some of the learnings we've got from that market into other markets. And we also shall be visiting today China in particular. We're in six territories in Asia Pacific, starting in Australasia, in, in, Aust- in Australia, and in 2005, then into China, and from there on into other markets in the region of, of Asia Pacific. So, and we'll be touching on that shortly. But I think we want to go back in time, and we're talking about flagship store, and start with a flagship store which was instrumental, not only for our business in Europe and in Ireland, but on a global point of view. And I'll pass now the word to Gary here on this particular project. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much, Tobias. Uh, Eurospar Barrow Street, 2009, uh, something sort of going back quite a a while here. Um, And the store was instrumental, as Tobias said, in terms of creating change, not only for Ireland, but for Europe and for many other sort of aspects of our business. It's a true flagship in the sense that it was uh, developed to trial and test a number of new initiatives, both food service, uh, food solutions, uh, equipment, and also technology. A big focus of the store this time was around uh, customer needs, changing shopping missions and responding to those needs. And we, it's no sort of mistake that we've got enjoying now as the umbrella brand for this central served island for food service. Uh, and that brings together hot, cold, ready to eat, made to, to order, uh, uh, eat in store takeaway. It has service for all of those elements. learned from our Irish colleagues and from the developments in Ireland. And we always refer to this as the cousin. Uh, this, this was the Chinese cousin of the store in, in Barra Street. And Hong Tzu was our first store of this size, because up until then, our average store size in China had been 8,000 square meters or 80,000 square feet, been huge hypermarkets. So this was the first community proximity uh, lifestyle store, as we refer to it. And then the Sikitsu came back from around global retail comes home and we brought in here and expanded it and it's this is in Guangdong province so there's a lot of focus not only on noodles but also dim sum so we added the, the product range and modified it and it was a phenomenal uh, success as well as the the same central island layout which we introduced in Ireland we took that same sort of layout and flow to this store here and it began successful. Interesting looking back now over a decade, 2009, also the use of technology in China was already really starting and the uptake and integration 
of technology such as QR code scanning, which has been slower on the uptake in the rest of the world, was already fast in China, and intelligent scales, which we brought into. So this was our incubator store for some of those technologies back then. And that, in the context of that, this the typical stores we were opening were these giant hypermarkets before them, which gave a big challenge on the supply chain. Because you can't go from a hypermarket business to a smaller store business overnight. Because these hypermarkets we were opening, this is the South China Mall wow. store, which opened a year earlier, were up to 21,000 square meters, three stores in size. And the business was very different. I mean, there's had 40 plus checkouts, you had 10,000 customers a day, it was a huge mass volume business. Wow. And we were positioned in what we call tier two and three cities, and we were going deep into those uh, uh, stores and into those provinces at the time. And to do that, this was the distribution center we built in 2009 in Guangdong, and this was taking the learnings. It was literally it was a fast track project, 45,000 square distribution, square meter distribution center. We built one of these a year in, in China at that time because we needed the distribution center and the production centers and then to bring in the technology and transfer all of the international know-how that we had into the Chinese uh, business. And they went from standalone hypermarkets to the distribution centers, the production centers, which were already doing the food to go and ready to eat uh, products, fresh, multi-temperature, into the community stores. The case picking, the unit picking allowed us to get into that smaller format and then also added the independence. So it was a circular model, which was key. And that community store concept, the proximity convenience, so really free growth formats for us. We termed it lifestyle supermarkets, where we're targeting the affluent growing middle class in China. Today, that's the generation Z, which is really driving also the consumption and the growth of the growing middle classes, not only in Shanghai, Beijing, but many of the tier three cities. And then convenience was really starting and growing. And we started with online retail at that point. And if I look back, I left China in 2015, online penetration grocery at that time in the industry was around 4%. And so it's grown enormously because now if you look in, in sort of in 2019, it would have grown up to 10% of grocery. And the projections are now looking forward by the end of 22, this McKinsey's projection will be over 20 and possibly up to 25% of grocery sales in China by the end of 22, already online. That's a huge number, isn't it, Tobias? Yeah, it's been, a, it's been obviously, it's been a, a huge change, and, but it's also presented not only opportunities for the large technology platforms, the Alibabas, the JTs, but also retailers like ourselves with a strong density of stores in urban centers who can link those proximity stores to online ordering. Because the interesting thing about China is it's same-day delivery. Online grocery, about close on 50% is same-day delivery. And even within one hour, it will be about 15% of online grocery retail in China will be within an hour. So it's instant. It's a different type of mission. So that gives opportunities for the picking store connected with a local delivery. Uh, 2018, we were doing also mobile payments. About 70% of our payments in China were already mobile payments. As we speak today, the uh, the technology that's been most been taken up in store has been uh, self self scanning. Uh, it has been the use of QR codes. If you pick up collection points, it's been also about the use of mobile payments. And you know, with some of the stores here examples, we're using facial recognition tied in with the, the likes of the AliPays and so forth in terms of payment solutions. Those are just normal now. You know, and those earlier photos of forty man checkouts. Now, they've been reduced now because it's all gone into, in particularly in the urban centers, into self-checkout. That's into outstanding. So a great basis for them on digital and learnings from that to then bring it back to Ireland or bring it back to Europe. So we, we, pick, we use Ireland here because it, we have another flagship store pro project, which Gary would like to now maybe share with you about how we took that off. So we'll go back to 2009, 2010, and we were sharing the learnings from Western Europe to Asia. You know, we were taking everything in terms of systems, processes, design, uh, uh, food service, all the, all the elements. And now we've sort of come on a, a decade on, 
and the the flow of traffic, the flow of knowledge, the flow of information is the other way. You know, it's just it's just totally flipped uh, around. So you know, when we come into sort of the the work we've done recently um, in terms of with Spar Island uh, and bringing that back into the the, the work on Spar Millennium Walkway in particular, a lot of that is driven by that technology. You know, it, it, in in sort of say five years ago, ten years ago, we were going to the US. Yes, we're going to, to UK, going to Ireland looking for look and learns. You know, probably more recently, we've gone to Hong Kong, we've gone to Seoul in Korea, we've gone to Shanghai, we've gone to Bangkok, because those are the hubs, those are the places that you get the innovation around technology and adoption. So we're having to learn. So it's totally switched around. So yeah, all of that was picked up and taken back to Ireland. So sort of, you know, the, the, the sister, as you say, the brother, the cousin, whatever it's going to be, has come home. Um, but not home for long because that will get changed and it will get taken somewhere else again in the next one. So this pulling back into Ireland allowed us to sort of say, okay, let's take that technology, let's take those learnings, let's sort of look at the fundamentals of our business and create the next generation of proximity stores across the entire sort of estate of spa in Ireland. And that's allowed us to sort of look at store profiling and I'm, I'm sure that Joe that's something that you'll do when you do flagships you've got to look at sort of store profiling and how do you define what look and feel goes into which store so this is very much focused probably two parts to it one is very much customer centric what's the shopper behavior what are the shopper needs what are the demographics how is the shopper shopping our current stores all that data and information sort of is one sort of set of knowledge and then the other part is really about the the actual store itself, what is the size, what is the location, uh, all those sort of physical attributes. And we sort of have to bring those together. And that, in this case, we had developed sort of four, which were lifestyle markets, your usual and everyday uh, needs. Market, as it suggests, is very much a, a full supermarket shopping. So a big emphasis on food and veg as you enter. It's got an emphasis on butchery, deli, bakery, wines, but also a, a large assortment of dry grocery and a focus, as you can see on the value ends in this visual, of gondola ends. So it's that full supermarket shopping. And then conversely, this is Millennium Walkway in the heart of Dublin. This is a lifestyle store. If you sort of look at the, the spa deli, this food service, this is both spa's food service and concessions. So we sort of complement each other. Uh, you know, we have subways in some of these stores and there was a concern that with that erode spa sales, not at all. It's a different customer, different dynamic, and they actually both grew. So we have a lot of food initiatives. So Six Street Food Bar, Salad Food Bar, all those things sort of how do we keep that vibrancy uh, that the lifestyle customer needs, that younger generation uh, needs? And how do we add other pieces to it in terms of the, the, the space within the store? Spa Deli, food to stay, food to go, hot and cold take away and eat or eat it in store. You know, that seating that we talked about earlier on with regards to sort of Barrow Street. Here, it probably represents one quarter of the space of the store. And this is a city center store, which is a premium. It's also interesting to know there that there are power uh, banks in there. You've got USB chargers built in to the tables. Um, but also about the tone of voice, you know, that we did a lot with regards to the communications. How do we build this in such a way that the communications are integrated into the structure? It's not because quite often the, it's a sort of a secondary process, but we didn't want it to be a secondary process. We wanted it to be part of the solution, so that at your service rather than pay here. So it's, it's only a small change, but it's actually just a bit more informal. It's more sort of personal with, with the shopper um, and trying to sort of break down some of those barriers. So it's, it's got all those elements that you might expect uh, that you'd have in, in a, in a full-blown um, uh, flagship. But that, that look and feel you asked before, Joe, about sort of, you know, do we take the whole thing? Well, for that one in terms of Ireland, that did trigger uh, an exercise and work with Spa UK in terms of refreshing their stores. But their stores are smaller, different sort of slight, slight locations, different emphasis towards food service. But the principles were certain still the same in terms of how you're dealing with the different shopping missions, making them convenient uh, and, conv and adding convenience. So this one is a visual to sort of illustrate what we we're doing with Spa Havana Street, Glasgow, what was a flagship store for the new look and feel for Spa UK. So this is our computer visual, and it's quite important to sort of understand why we develop those visuals to that level of detail. 
it's so that everyone can understand it. We can present that to the entire team, even those people that sort of maybe not 3D literate, but they can understand the visual. And we can use that with suppliers. We can do that in discussions with the buyers. We can use that in equipment manufacture. And you can see that visual and then that implementation. It's almost the same thing. Netherlands. Uh, this is a gentleman, Erwin Binnefeld, who's one of our leading retailers here, who just focuses on university stores. He's got 10 in the key university cities. And he's, uh, you know, we can call that a kind of like a rocket innovator for us because turbo charge, because in those areas, in, in those type of stores, you can try new things and it's been a fantastic success. And then you can learn from that and take it into other countries. So at the moment, we have a project back in Canary Islands that are looking at a university, which is looking heavily on the learnings from Lancaster and from the, in Amsterdam and other cities. And some of the examples of that was uh, back in 2003, Evan and the team at Spain University opened the first stores, which were 100% self-scanning. 2013, that was a way ahead of anybody in the Netherlands at the time. And they introduced, obviously, the, the technology um, also, which was called Skippen, which was Skip the Line, would be a nice way of, of translating it from Dutch into, into English. And again, this is you know, mobile uh, scan and go technology, which was then brought into place in 2017-18. So there were early movers. And having those entrepreneurial, innovative um, speedboats as retailers to, to change, to act like acting change is really useful because those flagships are they coming up through the organization, you take the learnings and spread those internationally. So it doesn't all have to come through the center down, it comes from, from, you know, from the ground up as well, which is possibly even stronger. And yeah, I just want to show them how that has moved forward in the Netherlands and the, the Spa Netherlands has really put a focus in that they want to put an investment, not only in technology, but into food service and expand that. And they uh, acquired at the end of last year, this uh, food service operator called the Toasty Club um this yeah, is we a, like this joe don't we uh it's great uh you know i love some of the names uh that they've come up with i mean they're just so unique and just you know they're, they're really fantastic it really makes it quite proprietary and and um really sort of elevates it too in my mind it re really uh it's fantastic yeah in the netherlands you know the toasty is an essential part of daily life right i mean i'm, I'm a german who lives in the netherlands and in amsterdam and uh yeah, well, this, it's very important in terms of having a good toasty. It's a warm snack. It's easy to prepare, it. but you can be quite adventurous with it as well in terms of the ingredients and so forth. So it becomes like a panini in some respect in, in Italy and other markets. So, and it's been very successful. And the integration of retail food to go with food service, and again, this acquisition acts as a, as a speedboat of bringing on board the processes, the systems which they can then roll out in their city stores. And these are some, and this has been a big thing for the spa in the Netherlands through their first flagship store program, where they take also international learnings in, apply them to the Netherlands, drive it very strongly, getting a present back in the city centers, iconic stores. This is in, the, in, in literally the equivalent in Central Park in New York. This is the equivalent in Amsterdam. This is the Wondel Park. It's the main entrance of, this, of the equivalent of Central Park for you there in, in Manhattan. It's a, an iconic building, the Byzantium, and there in the basement we have a, a wonderful uh, urban spa store run by an independent retailer who's, again, one of our, our change agents. And then we have to scale it down, and this is an 80 square meter version because the architecture of the older cities, uh, centers in Amsterdam, quite small frontages, long thin stores. So it's about having it flexible and adaptable to different uh, store sizes. And it's driven, as I mentioned again, by the youth and the entrepreneurship. And this is a key, a key point I want to bring out today, how important that is to our group. Um, these are some of the entrepreneurs, young men and women who've joined SPA and have been a key driver of change. The, the bottom uh, left here, there is a two retailers very near to where I'm sitting now in, in the center of Amsterdam, Ismail and Vessel. They were previously store managers for a competitor chain in large hypermarkets. They came to SPA. They received the funding, the financing support, uh, the, the, the opportunity uh, to get into and be their own entrepreneur. We call it ondernemer in Dutch. 
And this has breathed fresh life and energy, particularly into the urbanization for, for us in the Netherlands, but also in other countries. And that's been an integral part of, I suppose, the modernization. I think just on that point, Tobias, just to emphasize it for you, because I think it's a it's it's a key one, you know. So we've all met these kind of store managers who 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 can just who just nail it. And what you're doing with your funding is is allowing them to become to go on from that naturally and become entrepreneurs uh, this time with spa yeah I, I suppose they've got the creativity they've got the drive they've got the energy and they need the support of an organization like spa in the netherlands who is able to go and, and work with them so they can secure these sites go to the banks act as guarantees provide that collateral if you want to get them going and then you know they really uh, prosper, and that's and success breeds success. So you have a, a retail like Ishmael Vessel do well, and then others join, and this gets momentum, and this has been really important for us, and as a key part, not just in the Netherlands, but you know internationally, it's very much of our ethos. So, which brings me nicely, I suppose, to Denmark, um, because again, in, in Denmark, took a lot of learning from the Netherlands. They brought their retailers down here. They saw the transformation Spa Netherlands has undertaken and took the learning back to, to Denmark and opened a series of flagship stores to announce change in the organization, to bring retailers on board, to get that momentum. Tel Goldman was a key one, city center, conversion of a former discount store to a spa store, which is uh, was bold and uh, very successful. Again, young Energetic retailers coming in this gentleman, Ronny Bodegaard, uh, ended up winning the uh, Retail of the Year Award in Denmark, a big prize for us. It's the first time in the modern era we've won that prize at Spa in Denmark. And again, it, it sets the tone, it's success breeds success, and that's on the back of a very successful store. And uh, these are a bit bigger in the Denmark, it's more of your neighbor proximity store, 600 square meter area, big focus on organic. Denmark and together with Switzerland as the highest penetration per capita on organic uh, within in Europe. That would be two key markets. You need to grow the organic. So it was a logical one to introduce the Spa Natural, which is the Natural, which had been so successfully developed. And Gary will come back to that in a moment in the Canary Islands to bring the category solution back into the store in Denmark. So this is global retailing coming round. And again, the use of technology with the ESL, the digital uh, shelf labels. And what I particularly is a smart solution there in Denmark is that with the mobile phone, they're actually to scan and change the pricing with simple use. So they don't have to go to the back room to pick up the scanners anymore. So it's about how does technology become a useful resource, energy and save or time saving uh, factor. So yeah, that whole journey is just how it moves and lives and that takes on a life of its own. But for Spa Natural, which as you've seen now you know, come back in Denmark, it started its life obviously with the first stores in Spain. You know, when I look at a lot of these, the stores are so well designed, um, and yet I feel that the design is—it's um, a bit timeless. I think that's why you were saying it's four years old and it still looks like it—you know—just opened today. So there's a timelessness to it. But I also think that the designs are so supportive of the offer, and really, they've done an excellent job in every uh, every location we've seen so far where that I feel the design really supports the offer. It's not over-designed, um, and yet there's something that feels just so great about each one of the locations that they're welcoming, they're warm, they're inviting. Um, they have, a I feel like, a high level of design, but yet it's it's a, it's understated in some ways, and it's just very, very supportive. It, it's really the store itself that sort of stands out, and I think that's really a great job of any designers to, you know, use design as a supportive uh, tool um, and not have it overshadow everything that else that you're trying to do. And I, I think Spar has really shown what a, what a great job that they've done. And it's all about the people, the offer. Um, um, but you know, the stores all look great. 
I, I guess when retailers like Jesus get a gut feel for something, you've got to go with it to buy it. Yeah, and, and that's why you know, when I talk about rocket change, or you know, these are your turbo boosters. You know, they, they can, and then you have those, that conviction and to work with, with and that we are really blessed to have that opportunity. And you know, you, you take that in a, that innovation, you try to bottle it up and, and spread it, and, and share the best practices with others in the group, and that's how we work. One phrase sort of sums up for us: product is the hero. Uh, you know, whenever we're doing the stores, the product is the hero. We don't want to look at fixtures. We don't want to look at lighting. We don't want to look at the floor. We want to look at product. So that everything we do, we try to make the, the product the hero. I was mentioning, you know, that we've developed a, a large assortment of, of own brand under the Spa Natural uh, uh, brand in order to take that forward. All products are organic, uh, and then they have various other attributes depending on the on the product, and they also have various other certifications. So Rainforest Alliance, UTZ, Fair Trade, etc. Again, depending on that, and we are adding to that as I speak. So the team, the buying, the trading teams are adding to that. We're doing food uh, in terms of convenience food solutions under the natural. So we're doing smoothies, juices, uh, uh, shots. We're also developing up uh, a spine natural bulk uh, uh, solution, a self-served zero packaging solution. So this is something that we're sort of finalizing now. And in the same principle, it is a full plug and play. So we have the branding, the communications, the product, the equipment, Everything is there to go. So it becomes a quite a straightforward exercise to implement that into stores. And that will be launched sort of May, June uh, of this year. So you can see where we're going with this in terms of growing and building it. And it, it's sort of part of our sustainability focus on environmental focus. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Gary, ahead of, ahead of launching it in the market. We really appreciate that kind, of, um, that kind of scoop. So thank you. Staying with the sustainable and ecological aspect, but moving it more to the building design. And I just want to move us now from the wonderful warm temperatures of the Canary Islands to the Nordics, to Norway. And this is on just outside the Oslo in uh, Spasnaraya, which was opened in August 2018. Uh, our eco ecological flagship store developed by Norwich Group and Spa Norway. It was at the time, certainly, if not still now, the leading eco-friendly store in Norway and possibly in the Nordics. You'll see from the, the design, the outer clad is made up of, I think, just short of 90 square meters of uh, solar panels. We've got uh, a roof which has been covered by grass. One is for insulation. The other is also in terms of it reduces CO2. There's LED lighting throughout. The refrigeration is recycling and utilizing the heat. Um, yeah, many features there which have become standard now as they roll out and we've not only the Nordics but other countries, I'll share some examples in a moment, start to develop out and, and well, not start, but really expand the rollout of this technology. Butikken er dekket med gress på taket, som binder CO2. 75 kvadratmeter solcellepanel på fasaden gir over 7000 kWh med strøm i året. Gulv og fundament er laget av lavkarbonbetong og resirkulert armering. Vegger og tak består av massiv tre, og det er tre lags vinduer som sammen gir et lavere CO2-avtrykk, bedre innemiljø og en god atmosfære i butikken. Solcellepanelene på fasaden driver LED-belysningen, mens overskuddsvarmen fra kjølanlegget gjenvinnes og brukes til å varme opp butikken. Summen av alle energi- og miljøtiltak gjør at vi kutter CO2-avtrykket til butikken med opp til 60 prosent. Aldri før har vi kunnet tilby våre kunder en så fremtidsrettet matbutikk, så det er en stor glede for meg å kunne ønske dere alle hjertelig velkommen til Spar Snarøya. I think Dan, you visited this store, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's it's a remarkable it's a remarkable store, and obviously Norway is 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 the place to build a store like this. Yeah, and it's interesting in Norway certainly, but the other, in terms of the building materials, you see there's a lot of wood, uh, sustainable, um, also local in terms of the sourcing of it, and uh, which allows this. But we'll see that in other countries as well, which we've adopted the the similar approach and in tandem. But this has really been for us a standout one internationally. So if I jump then from Norway and I'll maybe stay into the more mountain territory and move to Austria, who has sustained leadership and growth in terms of winning market share. And they grew in 2020 by 16%, taking their sales up to now over 8 billion euros in the Austrian market. And for the first time, uh, achieved market leadership, number one position in the market. 
a phenomenal sustained growth, but also a huge investment that's gone into these type of larger format stores. And this particular is the Interspad in Imst, which has uh, the solar panels on the roof. It produce about 215,000 kilowatts of, of energy. It's equivalent to 60 households worth of energy uh, and en electricity that's produced from this one. But it's not just one store, because the secret in Austria of this is to roll this up. And by the end of last year, we've got over 100 of these new stores. And these are smaller now, proximity stores as well. Or this is a 650 square meter supermarket where these panels come in. And in total, it's part of Austria, uh, just in Austria there, are producing 4.8 million kilowatts of energy through the solar panels that are installed on the stores. That's the equivalent of 1,200 households electricity energy consumption. And that, that we don't source ourselves or produce from our own stores, we utilize either wind, water, or additional green uh, energy that is available for the providers. So a big dedication there in the construction of these ecological stores, because they save us when we convert the stores and renovate 50% less energy consumption. On just in terms of what we're doing with the food and because uh, sustainability isn't just in the construction and design of, of our stores, but in, on the design and formulation of our products. And this is Gerhard Drexel, chairman and of the supervisory board of Spa Austria, who's been leading uh, figure in Spa Austria, but also internationally, and is very passionate personally in terms of health and reformulation of products and launched uh, the Sugar Out initiative, not only for Spa Austria, but industry-wide being the suppliers on board and our own commitments and results. There are 1,700 tons of sugar reduced out of our own brand products. And, and then you, you got to reach out as well to the, the uh, suppliers and bring on board entrepreneurship young and urban, uh, smaller challenger brands. And all of those, are, and you'll see that also back in, if you take the example of our university in the Netherlands, 35% of the sales of the products in those stores would be what we would term as um, sustainable and healthy. So this is where a lot of the product development is also coming from. And that's where the interest in healthier nutrition, challenger brands are key there because I think you know, they're agile, they're fast to respond to these trends in some of the larger FMCG. And the example Gary showed from Spa Natural in Austria, it's called Spa Natural Pur, Nature Pure. The implementation in the hypermarkets of those has been a phenomenal success and we'll be rolling that out. Um, and then not only in terms of the food products, but also non-food. And there's been some initial tests we're doing on refillables, on with partnering with our suppliers, the likes of Ecova and others where we have the refill stations. On Very interesting. Detergents. So it's all part of a holistic approach to sustainability in reducing plastic, moving to biodegradable uh, solutions instead of staying with the, the, the heavily packaged pack, uh, products. And then food waste was a key area for us in Austria uh, with our Spa Gourmet store, but Spa International, we have an international collaboration. We have Too Good To Go, which is uh, an application coming out of um, the out of Denmark. And we've worked very strongly with to the to go uh, now in 1,300 stores across Europe. And this is an application which reduces food waste and through these what we call the magic surprise bags. So, and we just launched today or yesterday, we announced our partnership with Ganda from Northern Ireland, which fits side by side, which allows us to integrate these type of food reduction, waste reduction applications, bring together best of digital and sustainability in one aspect. So yeah, and all of that in Austria, I think it's in the, we've, we've bestowed the Austrian colleagues with the Greenpeace Supermarket of the Year Award, which is a tremendous acknowledgement of all of those efforts. And it's in Austria, but we can we use this learning, obviously, within our responsible retail forums to spread that knowledge. And as well, also, that you see in you know the store design, I want to make the point that SPA is never really, a, we're not about just duplication of uh, an existing uh, look and feel. And the Austrian example, the six regions, and each of the regions, they work with uh, local architects, and they give the opportunity to young up and coming architects to work with them on these type of projects. They're, they're uniquely adapted to the environments and the communities where they're placed. Like Norway, heavy use of wood and materials, and also very dramatic in terms of the architecture to differentiate in the markets. And I'll just run through some more examples on the Eurospace front. 
uh, where you can see there's a consistency in a, in a style, but in an adaption to each of the locations. And each of those new stores are designed and developed to a handle, where, which is eco-certified, which is an Austrian OGNI, O G N I, which is a sustainable uh, building and uh, approach to architecture and construction. And we utilize that. And again, those buildings means that they can reduce energy by 50% in those uh, new style of construction. Be that in the larger hypermarkets, like the Interspars that we operate, an example here from one of us in central Vienna. And yeah, so it's about taking those learnings across the different flagship stores in different sizes, and then sometimes doing unique one-off projects. This is Interspar Pronto, which was a, a satellite convenience store. So we have the Interspar hypermarket, which is a two-floor large hypermarket and shopping center. But because the shopping center is also a main, main railway station, we have a Pronto convenience satellite store next to it, literally 50 feet across the way, which has longer opening hours and caters for an earlier uh, shopper and has an eat-in solution. So, and again, you take, you take the learnings from these type of experiences and then we take them to the other markets. If I continue on the journey and then to neighboring Slovenia, which is the investment from the Spar Austria Group into early 90s when the opportunities came, online there has been hugely successful. Again, it's linked to store picking where we have then the, the deliveries made on, on a basis for our own delivery fleet uh, to the customer, but also a click and collect in Hungary and Budapest together with Vienna and Dublin, but we have some of the highest number of square meters per capita of spa anywhere in the world in those cities. And in Hungary, the, using the hypermarkets as the picking centers with in-store picking, which then offer click and collect, as well as delivery for our own fleet, has been a hugely beneficial, obviously, not only in the last year, it's been a growing trend, which has just been released with growth of over 300% during the, the COVID crisis. And... In Hungary, I think I just wanted to add is, again, going this multi-format, multi-channel journey. Only in the last six years have we really started to work with the, the forecourt sector. You've got the partnership with the Austrian Mineral uh, OMV. And a lot of those stores are actually dealer-operated, dealer which is seen as grow with 200 independent retailers in Hungary in the last uh, six or so years. So this has been, again, another turbo engine of growth by going from large formats, supermarket, city center, expanding into online, then developing the, the convenience and then bringing the independence. You will notice a similarity of the development also in China, multi-channel, multi-format. So, and Croatia is where today that we, we are currently operating uh, from, the in, from a company-owned perspective. We have a strong spa, but we uh, estate and also iconic Again, flagship stores in architecture and design in, in Croatia at the Interspa level, which you'll also find in neighboring Italy. And this is also a region which is operated and developed by Austrian Spa International AG, Aspiag. And this is Akapi, which is a beautiful store just north of Bologna. Uh, phenomenal developments there and, and also in the use of digital uh, communication within the store and self-scanning. But in Italy, I want to share with you today actually something different, which was a development back in 2017, which was uh, something unique, which is in Venice. So if you're planning your holidays and you want an inspiration for a retail study tour, I would invite you to come and visit us in central Venice to possibly one of the most beautiful spa stores in the world, in the Teatro Italia. And the Teatro Italia is our Sistine Chapel. It is a former cinema which went into decay which we brought back to life and the team in Aspiag Italy did a phenomenal job. Small Retail theatre Joe, literally. Yeah it's uh, you know it's funny it, it, all of these stores I'm looking at and drooling they're so beautiful but it's you know the design is almost part of the part of their brand I mean it's you almost come to expect 
you know, spar to deliver something at this level. And obviously this is just a, an amazing flagship, um, you know, who wouldn't want to be in this, uh, in this building. It's uh, absolutely fabulous. We are in the new Despar supermarket in Venice, the former Teatro Italia, a building designed and built in the early 20th century during the First World War. The theatre was later turned into a cinema, and a few decades later, it was donated to Ca' Foscari, the University of Venice. At the end of the 90s, it was permanently closed and left in a state of total neglect. In collaboration with the property ownership, Despar has now given new life to an historic building, important both for Venice and for its inhabitants, by restoring access to its premises. This was accomplished with utmost care and attention to this precious building, dating back to the early 20th century. All frescoes have been restored, and the supermarket project was designed to respect its hosting premises. The Venetians, as well as all the clients, can thus finally admire, after such a long time, a real gem of Art Nouveau architecture. I have the fortune to be in this beautiful place, and so I'm very, very happy. The most beautiful market in the world. For me, it's a satisfaction. I've come back to work here in Venice. Once again, Despar takes care of the territory in which it operates by returning value to the people of Venice. I want to kind of close out and talk about South Africa and the, and the spread of knowledge from that. And I, I'm interested in time, I'll do that quickly. Thanks. As I mentioned, Spa South Africa, we have a huge presence in South Africa and well over 5 billion euros in strength, a strong market share, and it's consistent growth. It's growth that's been built year on year. And again, on a multi-format strategy, we've got Super Spa, Spa, Spa Expresses, we meet all the needs of the, the populace, of the population, uh, in terms of all income groups as well. And it's a really diverse and independently owned and, and operated stores that are really integrated in the communities they're part of. And, and that is the success because we talk about hyper local and each store adapts and has the ability to have the articulate and express itself in that way, from not only from a design, but product range, but also in terms of, you know, if you look at the, the delivery of the execution, so this would be maybe in some of our, what we call the higher LSM living standard means stores in, in the group with more convenience items and, and beautifully executed from a design. And again, Spa Natural uh, appears. So not only does it work in Nordics, but it also works at the right customer profile and the right store profile, this also works again and is a trend that is as important in the Southern Hemisphere as it is in the Northern Hemisphere, health, nutrition, and sustainability. And at the same time, we've also expanded our footprint and our presence into the multi-format and again into the convenience with the Spa Express and there's a tie-up and partnership there with Shell in South Africa, which goes from strength to strength particularly as a lot of the stores are also dealer owned and operated by independents who may also be actual owners and operators of spa stores as well. And that gives a synergy and an additional benefit and brings also the brand and, and greater presence of the brand throughout the country. And South Africa, for us, when we look at the stores, what we call the lower LSMs or in terms of meeting more the mass market and the, the, the emerging market, where we have stores in deepest uh, rural communities like in Limpopo province, in Toyandu and these places. But taking the learnings from, from that and the adaption and what you have to do in terms of fresh and bulk merchandising and value and take that learning and then move across all the way in a partnership with a local market leader, a great company with a joint venture with CBL Biscuits, who is very much driving the whole sustainability agenda also in terms of manufacturing, who wanted to partner with Spa to introduce really world-class modern retail and to develop that jointly. And you can see from the stores that have opened, and I want to give fantastic credit 
to the colleagues of SPA in Sri Lanka, who have just really worked shoulder by shoulder together to deliver these world-class stores. And without being too arrogant to make it, but I think they've, you know, in many ways have created a, a renaissance or a, a, a real revolution of modern retail in Sri Lanka, taking the learnings, what have been tried and tested and what we learned from working in these environments in the sub-Saharan continent, bringing it across in Southeast Asia, working shoulder to shoulder, the Sri Lankan team. It's South astonishing. Africa. It's astonishing, Joe, isn't it? I, I love it how you've moved from South Africa to Sri Lanka. Just you can see the connections in terms of obviously the availability of that beautiful local fresh produce to buy us. Yeah, it's produce, it's product, it's the displays, it's the communication, it's the operating procedures, but it's also the what I think the team and um, leading the developments there. You've got Rob Phillipson as the chairman, and you've got Wayne Hodson who's been driving it, and, and uh, Martin Schumann, who's been who's now the CEO. I mean, they would tell you uh, their the success has been the culture, and it's been not only transferring the ideas, but building the, the culture and getting everybody on, on really believing in what they're doing, and building these stores to yes, take what works internationally, but also really catering for the local market, and that being a very value conscious. You know, this is a volume market. You know, you got 20 million people, half of which are under the age of 30. You know, it's a young, growing, dynamic country. It's a beautiful country with great opportunity, and we're proud to be part of it and uh, being able to have an impact. Which brings me to a close of, uh, I didn't go to all 48 countries together with Gary. We touched on, Gary, how many we touched on? 12? 14. 14. 14 today. So are we coming, we've slightly overrun, my apologies, but... Uh, the idea was to give you an impression of what flagship store programs mean for us, how they work internationally across borders, how they often come ground up from the entrepreneurs in our business, the turbos, the, the engines that we have, utilizing their creativity to spread the, the, these learnings amongst the group. And then how new partners join SPA, like our partners in Sri Lanka, and we just also, I must mention, we just launched in Ghana during the pandemic, so we actually opened it to a new country, phenomenal business that we're building there, which was a regional retailer says, we want to have access to these resources. We want to be part of SPA, but we want to keep our independence and our ownership. We want to be part of a bigger global group. And that's been really successful. And that's because it's been in our name back to 1932 when we were founded, which is Door Eindrachtig Zamenwerken. This is yes. Profiteering, which is the P, Alan, which is everybody, Vegomata Sustainability, S-P-A-R. So put in a modern context, better together. Thanks very much to you guys. And thank you to SPA and SPA International. And, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see you again uh, soon, um, hopefully in, in person. So just, just closing up, um, Ireland is our next stop um, for Shop Talk Live World Tour. We do have a week off next week. Um, there'll be no Shop Talk Live next week, but our next episode, uh, because of the Easter holiday, will be actually be on a Thursday, the 1st of April. And uh, we'll be joined, uh, I'll be joined with um, a very good friend of mine as co-host, uh, Frank Gleason, who's of course president at Aramark Northern Europe, as well as uh, former NAX chairman on the NAX board. Uh, he'll be my co-host and we'll be um, joined by Joe Barrett, uh, Chief Operating Officer at Apple Green, of course, um, Apple Green, one of the big big names in our industry as an innovator. And again, continuing the spa story from where we left off today, David Bagnall, who's a, who's a board member at BWG Foods um, and the chief operating officer uh, there. So that will be live from Dublin uh, on the 1st of April. Uh, please join us then. And thank you very much for watching uh, this afternoon.